Okay, so continuing on, we finished up on Wednesday last week talking about the singular prostate. Now we're ready to talk about two little tiny glands down at the, the base of the penis um, called the pair or the, the bulbal urethral or Cowper's glands. As I said, located at the inner end of the penis, just below the prostate. <clears throat> Function of these guys is to produce a clear alkaline fluid lubricating the head of the penis, protecting the sperm by neutralizing any uh, acidity of residual urine. They also secrete mucus uh, to lubricate the end of the penis to decrease the number of sperm damaged during ejaculation. So this is where that pre-ejaculate fluid comes from, uh, the kind of trickle out fluid that um, comes out of the urethra before the actual you know, powerfully released uh, semen. Uh, Speaking of the urethra, we talked about this the other day. It's a shared tube of both the reproductive and urinary systems. It consists in men of three parts, a prostatic urethra that passes through the prostate, the intermediate or membranous urethra, and then the final and longest region, which is the uh, <clears throat> spongy urethra as it passes through the spongy tissue of the penis, leading both urine and semen out through the external urethral orifice. Um, the penis itself is a cylindrical organ, passes urine and just, uh, serves to deposit semen into the vagina. We'll talk about all the parts of it that are labeled here on this next slide. Now, this figure is the same figure that we saw at the end of our urinary lecture. And I told you guys, we would just wait and highlight and identify the structures when we got to it. And I said, you know, the picture will be a lot more um, intricately labeled. Here you can see there's a lot more lines and things labeled than there was at the end of that lecture. So I think it'll just be easier for me to tell you what not to worry about um, for the exam than rather go through and tell you what to highlight. So if you wanna just cross these off or whatever you need to do, we'll start on the left side. Once again, these are the things you do not need to worry about. So the sacrum, the, I'll just call it the V pouch because I can't really pronounce that. Vesico rectal pouch, I guess maybe. Coccyx rectum. And then anus, we don't need to worry about. See everything at the bottom will be stuff to know. At the top on the right side, the peritoneum. And you can skip down to the pubic symphysis and deep muscles of the perineum. Everything else should be fair game or will be fair game for the exam. Make sure if you didn't already label it, when I talked about this the other day, there's a little tube that comes down from the seminal vesicle. This little duct right here is called a seminal vesicle duct, and it joins with the ampulla of the vas deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. So if you didn't already label that, label that now, along with everything else you need to know that. Okay, on to the penis. So in more detail, we're going to learn about it here on this page. This fall. All right, penis contains urethra and is a passageway for ejaculation of semen and the excretion of urine. It is cylindrical in shape and consists of three parts, a body or shaft, a root, and a gland's penis. The body or shaft makes up the bulk of the penis and consists of three cylindrical masses of tissue. Uh, now, here we see uh, a term called corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum. If I go back to the previous page, and we see uh, the word uh, corpus cavernosum and corpus spongiosum again. Corpus, as you see here on both of these terms, is singular. Corpora is plural, and so is cavernosa. Cavernosum is singular. So since there's only one labeled, since we've only got half of the body in this picture, we only have it listed, or we have it listed as corpus cavernosum. And down at the bottom, you can see we have them listed as corpora cavernosa. If only one of them label, was labeled, it would be the corpus cavernosum. Okay. Now, kind of looking at it, this is kind of an easy illustration to show it. Same thing here, essentially showing you the same thing. The penis has been essentially just cut off. So we can see those three cylindrical masses of tissue. Uh, 
the most of the volume of the penis comes from the two corpus cavernosum or the corpora cavernosa if you pluralize it. Okay. At the center of each of those is a very important um, penile artery. Um, the deep artery of the penis, as you can see, is labeled. It's kind of harder to point out. That's what um, allows blood to flow in and then fills up kind of the, these um, sinuses within the penis and enables it to um, engorge with blood, and that's what causes an erection. Surrounding and enclosing the spongy urethra is the corpus spongiosum. So it's kind of easy. Spongiosum, spongy urethra is what's inside. Okay. Um, the root of the penis is what attaches it to the perineum. Remember the perineum is uh, the floor of the pelvic cavity where you find a lot of muscle. Uh, there's three parts, uh, one bulb, and then two cura. Now cura is plural, crus, as you can see it labeled down here with just only one of them, is singular. Okay? The bulb is the extended portion of the base of the spongiosum, shown right here on both sides of the urethra. And then tapered off to each side are the two Cura or cruce, if you're only labeling one of the penis, and as I said, they're separated in taper portions of the, the cavernosa. Uh, the glans penis is the enlarged distal end of the penis, sometimes described as the head of the penis. Uh, it is the distal end, as I just said, and it's specifically of the corpus spongiosum. Its margin is known as the corona, which is where it kind of just you know, starts to taper out. And then at the very um, end of it is the external urethral orifice. And in a um, uncircumcised male, it would have what we call the prepuce, which is more kind of uh, commonly called the foreskin, as it's shown down there in the, the image. Weight of the penis is supported by two ligaments, which you can actually see in both over here, continuous with the fascia of the penis. There are the fundiform ligament, which is shown kind of here on both sides, and then the suspensory ligament in the middle of the the fundiform uh, arises from the inferior part of the linea alba. And the linea alba is what separates, or excuse me, yeah, it's the, it's the vertical line that separates the two sides of the um, rectus abdominis muscles. The suspensory ligament arises from the pubic symphysis, that little piece of cartilage between the two hip bones. If I go back to the previous page, we can see the suspensory ligament very nicely. Um, there's that pubic symphysis that I was mentioning, and you can see extending off of it is that suspensory ligament. Um, as far as what I want you to know, I'm definitely gonna have you guys know this image. I'd say pretty much everything in this image would be fair game with the exception of the deep muscles of the perineum. It's kind of a weird image, but it's essentially the, the top of the penis or the front of the penis, I guess, if you're thinking of it just like hanging straight down, has been removed all the way kind of even back into the body. So we can see the, the very um, bottom of the bladder and all the stuff kind of in between the prostate, the two uh, bulb urethra or calparous glands. Um, you can see the bulb and the roots and all that, uh, the bulb and the curve of the root of the penis and that wonderful stuff that we just talked about. This is a anterior view, penis has been removed so we can see the three kind of chambers. Some of the you know, parts of the scrotum and the, the testes have been removed so you can see some of those kind of things that we talked about last time. What I want you to know here, I'll start here on the left side, the fundiform ligament, suspensory ligament, the corpus cavernosa, corpora cavernosa, spongy urethra, corpus spongiosum, a scrotal septum, cremaster muscle that we talked about last time that helps lift the entire scrotum and um, testes up to help regulate body temperature or help regulate testy temperature. Dartos muscle, that also helps regulate um, testy temperature. The scrotum, don't worry about the skin of, just scrotum is fine. Okay, on the right side of the image, the spermatic cord that's shown here with the circular part, uh, basically all of this, which includes the blood vessels, the nerves, which I'm not gonna worry about you knowing. That cremaster muscle has been cut away so we can actually see those things. But don't worry about it. Do know, and kind of hard to see in here, but uh, you can see it a little bit, the ductus or vas deferens. Remember that carries the sperm away from the epididymis, which is the next thing I want you to know. The epididymis, remember we learned a lot last time, is where we store sperm. Um, and then know the two membranes that surround the testes, the vaginalis and the albuginia that are labeled there. As far as the internal spinotic fascia, Rafe, don't worry about that. Okay, this image on the right, you know, I always try to include 
cadaver pictures whenever possible, just kind of see what the real thing looks like. Not something I'm gonna ask you to know. And this image is a posterior view, which is basically looking straight at the back of the body. One thing I like about it is it kind of shows the two fast differences coming around the bladder. They widen out, becoming ampullas, or the ampulla of the vas deferens or ductus deferens. Here are the two seminal vesicles. You can see they meet together, forming the ejaculatory ducts, which dump their secretions, sperm from the vas deferens, seminal vesicle secretions, into the prostatic urethra found inside the prostate, and then on down. This is not an image I'm going to ask you to know for the exam. You know, you've got enough to know with these two and this one. So we'll move on from that. One last slide to talk about here with men. Talking about semen and sperm. Just a little bit. All right, each day about 300 million sperm complete the process of spermatogenesis. Remember, spermatogenesis is just a form, uh, fancy word for sperm making. Think about that, 300 million sperm per day. That's incredible. You know, it only takes one sperm, remember, to unite an egg, or unite with an egg to form a, a zygote that becomes a baby. So 300 million is a lot per day. And then, you know, the majority of those by far and away are going to just essentially be wasted um, ejaculated out that you know don't essentially mount up to anything. Structurally, sperm are about 16 microns in length, contain several structures adapted for reaching, but also penetrate, penetrating an egg cell. Two principal parts of a sperm exist, what we call the head and the tail. The head is very important because this is where you find the nucleus with 23 highly condensed chromosomes which um, along with the 23 chromosomes that an egg has, combine and form a 46 chromosome or 23 pair zygote, which is the cell that we all begin our life as. Covering the tip of each head is a cap-like vesicle called acrosome. And inside are enzymes that enable it to kind of burrow in and penetrate the layers that surround what's called a, uh, a secondary oocyte, the egg cell that's ovulated out of a female's ovaries into her fallopian tubes. The tail itself really is just, you know, helpful for propelling the sperm during locomotion, so it enables it to swim. It consists of a constricted neck, which is made up of um, centrioles that form microtubules that comprise the remainder of the, the remainder of the tail. The middle piece is important because it's where the mitochondria are. Remember that's the powerhouse of a cell giving energy to the, the entire sperm for swimming. Principal piece is the longest piece and then it tapers forming this kind of whip-like in piece tail. Okay. Uh, semen is a mixture of not only sperm, and, but it's also seminal fluid, fluids coming from things like the bulbar urethral glands, the prostate and the seminal vesicles. Um, typically is a volume of two and a half, two and five mils. It's not a lot. And of those mils, there's about 50 to 150 million sperm. That's per milliliter. Um, slight alkaline pH, 7.2 to 7.7, .7, mostly due to the secretions from the seminal vesicles. It um, provides a transport medium, nutrients, and protection for the sperm, and coagulates, which is just a fancy word for clotting after ejaculation due to clotting proteins. As far as the pictures go, this is the one I want you to know. It should be one that's in your labeling packet. Make sure you can identify the parts of a sperm cell. This picture is essentially the same one that we saw at the end of the urinary system lecture, the one that we started kind of talking about here today. Sagittal section from a cadaver where you can see a lot of those same things, just you know, maybe not quite as clearly as we can uh, see them in that other picture, but it's kind of cool to see the real deal. This is essentially the same one as, oops, sorry, this one right here from the, the previous slide, just a little bit more kind of uh, superior looking, so you can't see much of the penis. Um, but still some pretty cool stuff. You can see the, the um, similar vesicles real nice. The prostate is very visible. The big bladder is very visible. See the ductus or vas deferens coming around. So some cool stuff, but as always, you know, not something I won't worry about you knowing for the exam.
Okay, that's it for men. Well, the last few slides here are going to be about the female reproductive system. Just like we did with men, we're going to start with the primary sex organs of a female, what we call the ovaries, which we know we've talked about before that because we learned about the hormones like estrogens and progesterone that they produce. Call them the primary female sex hormone or primary female sex organs because they produce the eggs. Now there's another term for eggs, ova, and that process is called oogenesis. We talked about spermatogenesis in men. Um, oogenesis is the production of those eggs in females. The ovaries are held in place by a series of ligaments. There's a pair of broad ligaments, which are folds of parietal peritoneum, of the parietal peritoneum, attaching the ovaries uh, to the ovaries by a double layer fold of peritoneum called mesovarium. Ovarian ligaments help anchor the ovaries to the uterus. The suspensory ligament attaches the ovaries to the pelvic wall. You can see some of those here in these couple pictures, some of them here in this posterior view um, from or that we'll get to more kind of on the next page when we move on to things like the uterine tubes, uterus, vagina. Um, two tissues cover the outside of each ovary, which we can see one of them here, uh, a, ter a germinal epithelium, and then there's a tunica albuginea. The germinal epithelium is the outer layer of simple epithelium, so it's a single layer. The tunica albuginea is uh, a fibrous layer inside of that, for whatever reason. They just didn't draw it in and, and label it. So um, you're not going to have to worry about identifying it, just the germinal epithelium. Those enclose the interior of an ovary, which is what we can see here in this picture. Not my favorite picture, but it does show what we call the ovarian cortex and the ovarian medulla. Now, physiologically, and really kind of anatomically, there's a lot more going on with the cortex. The cortex is where you find these fluid filled bubbles called ovarian follicles, um, each of which you can see there's several different forms of them just going through different stages of development, starting kind of the simplest and eventually becoming a great big bubble. And inside of each of those bubbles is an egg cell that's developing and getting ready for being ovulated, which is what this is actually showing you here. The discharge of what's called a secondary oocyte, which is going to be released into this fallopian tube or oviduct, whatever you want to call it, we'll talk about it on the next page. The medulla really is not a whole lot going on. There's blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. It's just loosely arranged and connected tissue. As far as the image goes, you know, it's not my favorite, but you can see the germinal epithelium, the cortex, and the medulla. So those are things that I would highlight. Don't worry about anything else. So germinal epithelium, cortex, medulla are visible, so highlight those. Okay, over on the right is that sagittally sectioned um, female reproductive system and urinary system structures. Um, we can see a lot more things are labeled than what was in the, the previous uh, uh, lecture. So um, you're gonna be highlighting the following. So please highlight the following. The uterosacral ligament, the posterior fornix of vagina, you can skip down to vagina. Then on the right side, everything except for the pubic symphysis. Now we'll get into things like the uterus, the fallopian tubes, ovaries we just talked about, but the fimbriae that are attached to the ovaries along with the external genitalia here in the next couple slides. This is kind of a, a nice view to show you a little relationship on like where things are located in respect to one another. So as you can see here, this is the anterior part of the body. So this is the front of the body. This would be the ab muscles, rectus abdominis muscles. Just deep to those, right in front is the female bladder. Sitting posterior to that is the uterus. And you can see the ovaries and the fallopian tubes that connect to the uterus. Right in behind that, posteriorly to it, is the rectum, as uh, we can see right here. But this is not an image I'm going to ask you to know. This image over here is just the cadaver version of this. So it's kind of cool to see. It's a little, you know, kind of trickier to kind of point some stuff out, but it's still 
you know, a handy picture to have, not something I'm going to ask you to study, though. So just the top two images there on that page. We'll talk a lot about the picture here at the bottom of this page, which is going to contain your uterine tubes or fallopian tubes or oviducts for you ladies out there, the uterus, and the vagina and all associated structures. All right, we'll start with the uterine tubes, also known as fallopian tubes or oviducts. I kind of use them all just kind of interchangeably. Active conduits for an ovum to reach the uterus. Ovum is um, what's described as a fertilized egg. Uh, the uterus, as you guys um, can see, is known as the womb. That's where the baby will develop. So that's where the ovum goes and implants, sticks to the wall of the uterus and then develops into the baby. Uh, these uh, oviducts transport the what we call secondary oocyte that we said was what was ovulated, the egg cell that's ovulated from each ovary toward the uterus. There are three distinctive regions to each um, fallopian tube or uterine tube. The first is the widest, what we call the infundibulum, and it's going to contain ciliated cells that help pull the egg cell in this direction. Actually, there's ciliated cells throughout, but there's um, a lot of very important ones here in the infundibulum. Uh, associated with the infundibulum, you can see these little finger-like structures. These are called fimbriae. Um, fimbriae, as you can see, finger-like projections attached to the ovaries. Ampulla, I would highlight that this is typically the site of fertilization by sperm. It's kind of an important um, thing to know. This is the middle and longest part of a fallopian tube. And then the narrow leading to the uterus region is called, <clears throat> excuse me, the isthmus. Okay. The wall of each region, the entire uterine wall, consists of three layers, a serosa, which is a serous membrane lining the outside, middle muscularis made up of two smooth muscle layers that help propel the oocyte forward, and then the inner mucosa, consisting of ciliated columnar epithelial cells, help to move that oocyte forward, and then secretory cells that lubricate the tube and nourish that oocyte. Once again, the uterus is also known as a womb, a thick muscular chamber that functions to harbor the fetus, provide a source of nutrition for it, and expel it at the end of its development. And that's kind of a fancy way to, or really not fancy way to say, you know, to push the baby out when, you know, labor is taking place, when a mom is giving birth. Uh, three parts of a uterus exist a dome-shaped superior region called the fundus, tapering central body, which is in the middle, and then um, the skinniest part is called the cervix, and I'll talk a little bit more about the cervix here in just a minute. There are three layers to its wall, each of which ends the same way with uh, the term metrium. There's a peri, a myo, and an endometrium. The perimetrium is a serous membrane lining the outside. The thickest is the myometrium and the prefix myo as we've learned and i've said this a few times this semester always means muscle this is where you find smooth muscle that's what helps push the baby down through the cervix and out through the vagina so this is a very important layer for childbirth and this is where you know those painful contractions come from when a female is going through labor and then the endometrium endo is a prefix that always means inside it's a highly vascular, so a lot of blood flow travels through it. It's mucosa. Um, actually, it's two layers thick, uh, a stratum basalis and a stratum functionalis. One of those two, and I won't really get into it, but is shed each month when a female is menstruating, and that's where that um, bleeding comes from. Okay, a little bit more about the cervix. Narrow region, once again, at the bottom of the uterus that leads to the vagina. So it is part of the uterus, and it's between it and uh, or is uh, the last part before the vagina. Uh, here, a female secretes cervical mucus that protects against bacteria that may enter the uterus from the vagina. 
Uh, and the cervical canal, which is shown down at the bottom, opens into the uterine cavity at the internal os, which is shown right there, and it opens up to the vagina at what's called the external os. So that's right there. Right here at the beginning of the vagina is um, a recess called the fornix. Okay, and actually I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to um, talk more about the uh, cervix and the uterus. Several ligaments that are either extensions of parietal peritoneum or fibromuscular cords help maintain the position of the uterus, which includes a pair of broad ligaments kind of on both sides, very big, um, they're very visible down at the bottom. There's what we call the uterosacral ligaments. We can see one of them here in our image. Um, there's cardinal ligaments and round ligaments. Some of those you can see better on this previous page. Um, there's a round ligament that I just mentioned. There's the cardinal. Kind of harder to show and identify in that picture. We'd have to really kind of make that picture really big to show them. Okay, let's now talk about the vagina, also known as the birth canal. Tube that allows for discharge of menstrual fluid, receipt of the penis and semen, and birth of the baby. Just like we've seen here the last few weeks, um, the inside of the vagina has these inner foldings which allow it to expand, called rugae. We saw that. Uh, back when we talked about the bladder in our last lecture, as well as the um, stomach in our digestive lecture. The wall of the vagina consists of three layers. Ahead of the tissue is the outer layer, holding the vagina in position. Muscularis is the middle layer, consisting of two layers of smooth muscle, permitting expansion of the vagina during childbirth and sexual intercourse. And then an inner mucosa. And uh, bacteria that line or are found in the mucosa uh, act on glycogen stored by the mucosa cells producing an acid solution helps, that helps to function to lubricate and protect the vagina against other microbial infections. Now I can talk about the resex called the fornix that surrounds it um, and its attachment to the, the cervix. The fornix is um, a contraceptive or a important site where the contraceptive known as a diaphragm would be placed, which would prevent any sperm from swimming up from the vagina and eventually fertilizing an egg once again, back up in here. Okay, very, very important image. I would say everything in it would be fair game. So we either talked about it on this page or on the previous page. With the exception, I guess, we didn't really talk about the ureter in this lecture, but it's visible. Not what you know. I'm really focusing on or having what need to focus on here, but go ahead and highlight just the entire picture, put a big fat star on it, because it's an important one. All right, moving on. Next slide here is a slide where we will discuss some of the more external structures of the female reproductive system compared to those that we just finished talking about, which were all very internal. Okay, let's talk about the vulva or pudendum, which is just a fancy set of terms that refer to the external genitalia of a female. A lot going on with the female external genitalia. First thing I want to talk about is what we call the mons pubis, a region of adipose tissue above the vagina covered with hair that functions to cushion the pubic bone and aid in lubrication. Now, down at the bottom, we have pictures here that we could color. Fortunately, I don't have a um, document camera or any other kind of easy way to do this as I teach. So I'll just kind of point these things out and you can color them on your own if you'd like. Um, I encourage you to, but you know, I can't you know, force you to, obviously. The first thing that's listed here, the mons pubis, um, for whatever reason, they decided not to you know, have you color this, labeled it, is that area just above the kind of more um, external genitalia structures, or more prominent, I should say, external genitalia structures. This picture on the right is kind of the external view or the surface view as it's labeled as. 
whereas this one is a dissected view where you know we've removed some of those external features going to show what's more internal um, first thing you can see these um, on the right image are the thick folds known as the labia majora thick folds of skin and adipose tissue that border each side of the vagina where you can find hair sebaceous and sudoriferous glands sebaceous from over oil and sudoriferous or sweat glands very prominently shown here letter e on both sides um, now the term labia and majora are plural if i go back a couple of slides where we can see one of them we can see them labeled as labia magus we see the labia minus also labeled labium is the singular form of labia Magus is singular and minus is singular from majora and menorah. Okay. Now the menorah are located medial to the majora and they secrete an oily substance. There's hair, uh, there isn't hair, excuse me. Um, it's absent here. And these are analogous to the spongy or penile urethra in men. So looking at the figure, their letter F on both sides here. Um, we can see them in both images. Here is an intact one, and then over here we've kind of removed part of it to show some kind of more internal structures. At the top, in between them where they unite is letter G, which we show in both pictures, and that's called the frenulum, okay, which you'll want to label or color. Between the menorah is the area known as the vestibule, letter M is basically all of this space both pictures show it very nicely and the vestibule is where you find the opening to the urethra or I should really kind of say opening from the urethra that's the superior opening a much smaller opening this is called the external urethral orifice so this is where the urine would come out the much larger space which should make sense because this is where the penis is going to go in or the baby would be coming out is the vaginal orifice. Okay. Um, so this is what the vestibule contains, external with orifice, vaginal orifice, among other things. Function of the vestibule is just to enclose those two openings and the ducts from the greater vestibular glands that I'll talk about towards the bottom of the page. In the picture on the right, we show surrounding it, letter P, is what's called the hymen, a thin fold of vascularized mucous membrane found within the vestibule, typically something that's associated with a you know, not sexually active female. Um, the last thing that we can see in our external or surface view are these structures associated with the clitoris. Okay. Clitoris is structured like the penis in men, except there is no urinary role. Its function is entirely sensory serving as the primary center of erotic stimulation. Okay. Surrounding this ball-like structure is this kind of triangular shaped letter H, which we can see part of it over here. And that is the prepuce of the clitoris, kind of like the um, foreskin of men. It's um, formed at the point where the labia minora unite, covering what we call the body of the clitoris and it's only allowing the glans clitoris to be exposed. The glans clitoris is that circular structured thing right here, or circularly um, shown structure, I should say. Um, the only part that's visible here, it's the last thing that you can see here in the surface view. This is equivalent to the glans penis in the men um, and is very sensitive because of the very sensitive tactile receptors that it contains. Passing internally from that is the body of the clitoris or the body clitoris as it's labeled there, letter J, uh, inferior to the pubic symphysis, you can see. It then divides and forks forming letter K, which we can see the entire thing over here on the left side of the image. We can only see the little end of it down here at the bottom because there's some structures covering it up, mostly muscle. That is called the cruce clitoris, okay, diverging from the glans clitoris like a V which can undergo vasocongestion like a penis. Uh, and vasocongestion, which is something I'm gonna talk more about here with the vestibular bulbs, is basically just like what a penis does and when it gets erect, it engorges with blood. Um, speaking of vasocongestion, vaso like I said, the vestibular bulbs, letter F, um, excuse me, not letter F, letter L, letter L, are the vestibular bulbs or bulbs of the vestibule, two elongated masses of erectile tissue deep to the labia that lie on either side of the vagina. 
And as I said, they can undergo vasoconjunction, causing the vagina to tighten when stimulated. So that's obviously things that are taking place during sexual intercourse. And these are analogous to the corpus spongiosum and bulb of the penis in men. Letter M that we can see one of them, there'd be another one deep to the vestibular bulb over here. Letter M is a greater vestibular or Bartholin's gland, which opens by ducts into the vagina, functioning to secrete mucus that lubricates the vestibule during intercourse. Analogous to the bulbo urethral or Cowper's glands in men, and several lesser vestibular glands also open in the vestibule, which uh, is probably gonna you know, play a big role in lubrication as well. Last glands I wanna talk about aren't visible here. They're so small and are um, what we call the paraurethral or Steen's glands, which secrete mucus. And these are actually embedded in the wall of the urethra, which is um, I included in this lecture because they are analogous to the prostate. So I tried to, whenever possible, include structures that you know are similar to what men have although you know obviously very different in what they do for a woman because men and women at this point we can see are very different so make sure you like i said either color them or identify them commit them to memory in case you see those pictures again all right on to our final slide talking here about what we call the Perineum. Perineum actually is, if I go back to this picture right here at the top uh, on the previous page, is what was described as basically just this general area between the genitalia in front and the anus and back. So, you know, we've talked about this before, um, back when we talked about the muscles of the body. We learned that there are skeletal muscles that are part of the perineum, and this is the case for both men and women even though we only show a female perineum here at the bottom. Um, it contains, like I said, the extra genitalia in the anus, bounded anteriorly by the pubic symphysis, posteriorly by the coccyx tailbone, and the two ischial tuberosities form the lateral side. So there's your diamond. But if you draw a line across from tuberosity to tuberosity, you can split that diamond into two uh, triangles, a urogenital triangle where all the urinary and genitalia structures are, and then the anal triangle where the anus is. As far as what I want you to know, you know, we can see a lot of those genitalia structures that we just identified on the previous page. I'm not gonna worry about you um, having to identify them again. I do want you to know just though the urogenital triangle and the anal triangle that are labeled. Hopefully nothing too crazy for you. And that brings us to our last thing to talk about, the breasts. Okay, describing a breast, it's a hemispheric projection of variable size on the chest each of which is located anterior to the pec major and serratus anterior muscles and is attached to them by a layer of fascia composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Each breast has a nipple and if we're talking about a female, a mammary gland associated with it. Men obviously do not have mammary glands, we do not produce milk. Strands of connective tissue called a suspensory ligament of the breast or it's called the Cooper's ligament, helps support the weight of the breast and unfortunately is what wears out especially if a female that's very large chested, very large breasted female does not do a good job wearing like a bra in her younger years. She likes to let them hang, as they say. Um, this can cause that ligament to kind of stretch out and it's not gonna you know, do a very good job as the female gets older and you know, is a big reason why that sagging situation takes place. Okay, internally, um, if a female, if we're talking about a female, we have mammary glands to talk about. We learned those earlier in the semester are modified pseudoriferous or sweat glands, specialized for the production of milk. Mammary glands consist of 15 to 20 lobes, each of which is separated by a variable amount of adipose tissue or fat tissue. Um, each of those lobes is composed of several smaller lobules. And inside of those lobules are grape-like structures called alveoli. Because why not name something else alveoli? 
like what we just learned about in our lungs or the sockets in our where our teeth are all of them have the same name alveoli and this is important to know are the bulb shaped glands where milk is produced that's very important um, surrounding each of those alveoli are myoepithelial cells that contract and force milk down into a duct networking system that carries the milk to the nipples um, Connected directly to each of those grape-like alveoli are what we call secondary tubules that converge and carry the milk into a mammary duct, which come towards the nipple and drain into lactiferous sinuses. And then at the surface of the nipple, the milk is delivered out through the lactiferous ducts, okay. uh, which is all this stuff I just kind of read through or just you know, kind of pointed out instead of reading through them. The nipple itself has those openings from the lactiferous ducts, about six to eight openings from them. Uh, the presence of the sebaceous gland makes the texture of the nipple coarse. Surrounding the nipple of variable size is the kind of pigmented area known as the areola, which also appears rough due to modified sebaceous or oil glands. Um, as far as the image goes, this is a sagittal section. You can see what has been done. This is a anterior view where we've kind of partially sectioned off to kind of show some of the more internal structures. What I want you to know is essentially in the middle here, um, with the exception of don't worry about the pec major or the adipose tissue. And then over on the right, you know, aerial and nipple are pretty easy to identify, so highlight those as well. And that wraps us up on the reproductive system and actually it wraps us up for the entire semester.